Hello and welcome to the video lecture for Ned Block's Concepts of Consciousness. This is the last lecture in our first set of articles about consciousness. We'll do another unit on it next time. So let's dive right in. This might be a, a difficult article for undergraduates. It is technical and it does have a very intricate structure to its argumentation and it assumes some background knowledge that you might not feel like you possess. So we'll just take it step by step and look at some main ideas. So I'll give you some background first to try and explain where he's going with this uh, dichotomy that he presents of mongrel concepts versus cluster concepts, which he mentions in the body of the article and then explicitly talks about at the very end of the article. So in the philosophy of science, a more general sort of field of study, there's a, an idea known as proto-science. So Thomas Kuhn came up with this. He was a philosopher of scientist, uh, science, excuse me, in the mid to late 20th century. And he proposed that a field of study counts as a proto-science if it does not yet have a scientific consensus on basic concepts, theories, or laws. So what a fully-fledged mature science has is an, a big community of scientists working on the same problems. And in order for that to happen, there has to be a bedrock of theories there ha that everybody believes are true or concepts. Okay, so if you're chemistry, you have to believe in the atomic structure of things. You have to understand where the periodic table came from and what it means and how the elements interact with one another. These are all pre -the these are all theoretical concepts that are agreed upon by the community of scientists known as chemists. And then within that structure, scientists can work on problems within chemistry. So when you apply the scientific method over time, and this is the scientific method in science at its most robust, because any individual person has bias, any individual person can only study a small set of data in their entire lifetime. So science at its most robust is the whole community over generations. And when the scientific method is applied over and over and over again, there's this solid experimental set of data. And that provides a foundation sometimes for entirely new fields of study. And we've seen that in history, wherein people have argued alchemy turned into chemistry as we know it today. So alchemy was the proto-science. People didn't have a really clear understanding of the structure of matter. They didn't even have concepts like atoms and electrons and valences and how chemical reactions happened. So they had to build up all this data over generations. And eventually with agreement on concepts, theories, and laws, they could do scientific work. Now, neuroscience, psychology, other physical sciences related to cognition, they've made really big strides in the past, say, 50 to 100 years. Um, but even with all of that progress, the mind and the brain are incredibly complex, not to mention adding in the rest of our bodies and our sensory organs and how they interact with the brain. So every little thing, subfield that they study is not likely proto-science. So if there's a vision scientist that knows a whole lot about how light enters our retina and gets tra translated as electrical impulses to different parts of our brains, that's very well grounded in science. But when we move to the study of consciousness as a whole, there is a very strong argument that consciousness studies are still in the proto-science stage. As we saw in the last lecture, nobody even agrees on what they mean when they say the word consciousness. So that's a good first step. Let's try to figure out what we mean 
when we talk about consciousness. And we can't just make it a term of art because if we're really looking to move from proto-science to mature or real science, real science is the wrong word, let's say mature science, then we need real empirical reasons, observable reasons to make the logical distinctions that we do. We can't just make it up on the fly based on intuition or based on personal experience. We need to do some kind of investigation, and sometimes that means introspection into our own experience because that's the access that we have personally with consciousness. We still have to approach it in a systematic way. So all of that is to say consciousness, as Bloch sees it, is a mongrel concept because it has all of these different ideas of what consciousness is just patched together. And thinkers, both in the physical sciences and in philosophy, move from definition to definition, sometimes without even noticing that they're doing so. And I want to stress, I want to stress and take a step back and say, it doesn't mean that what people are doing that are studying science the sciences related to consciousness and what, what it means to be conscious. It doesn't mean that they're not practicing activities in their professional lives that will not lead to the enrichment of our knowledge. It's not nonsense that they're doing just because it's not a mature science. It can and it will, and this is the work that needs to be done to move to a consensus about uh, concepts, classification, laws, and etc. I just bring all this up because if you find it difficult to understand these theories about consciousness, and many, many do, especially when you're first introduced to it, remind yourself that sometimes it's not your lack of understanding, but it's because um, there's a profound lack of agreement amongst thinkers and scientists on how to even discuss the issues or problems that we're all simultaneously interested in. And Bloch is saying something similar when he calls consciousness a mongrel concept. He compares it to cluster concepts, which are a lot, well, at least theoretically, are a lot more straightforward. We have a ton of cluster concepts in our life. He uses the example of religions. When we are, might be asked to define what a religion is, we would have to say something that deals with your spiritual life, that in physical practice often has a sacred place to meet and sacred texts and certain particular rituals that guide life. But not every single thing that counts as a religion has every single one of those criteria. Uh, and you don't have to have every single criteria to be a religion. That's why it's a cluster concept. Uh, another way to think about it that's slightly different but similar enough for our purposes is family resemblance. Another example might be the concept of game. Everybody knows vaguely what you mean when you say the word game, but if you really think about it, there are many, many different types of games out there. There's, there are video games, there are board games, there are sports that we call games. And we can define it with a list of criteria saying that games have rules. Uh, and people who are playing the game follow those rules to try and achieve some goal and state. Uh, the rules are gonna vary. The activities that you do to participate in the game will vary. Sometimes there's gambling, sometimes there's not. Uh, but the concept is still there. And that's why it is a cluster concept. And Block says, Consciousness isn't there yet. It might be eventually, once we all have a consensus on what it means when we talk about consciousness. But so far, we haven't even reached that step yet. Uh, one other problem is even when we agree that some particular feature counts as conscious. So if we have attention or awareness, if we have the ability to use abstract language, most people would say, okay, that feature of life has to count as consciousness. It has to be in our theories of consciousness. We still don't have a consistent way to classify those things. People have variously talked about them in many different ways. Uh, everything blends together and it's really confusing. So Bloch wants to make a start or an attempt 
on having a non-ad hoc, um, empirically based definition of what consciousness needs to include as a concept. Um, it needs to have good evidence. You can't just make it up because it seems right. That's sort of ad hoc. Um, even when we're just starting to talk about new ideas, new concepts, we still need to look for real signals as to begin our building up of theory and concept. And that's where he comes out with A consciousness and P consciousness. So P consciousness, as we talked about in the last lecture, stands for phenomenal consciousness. And he equivocates about an exact definition, meaning he keeps it vague. Uh, he, he says there's no real set definition of it. Um, and we need more precise definitions of it, but we can't get there quite yet because we still don't have theories that have a consensus about what qualia or the what it's like even are, if they're real, if they're a confused concept, if they're important to consciousness or just a byproduct. So we just have to take a very vague definition at this time until we have further data. And that is the what it's like. That is the experience. You wake up and you experience. Uh, as long as you're alive and awake, you are having a set of phenomenological experiences that can't easily be detected using scientific or empirical methods. A consciousness, access consciousness, is more like the information processing. It's the train of thought that you have at any given time and what is available to your conscious stream of thought at any given time. I have a very, very rough analogy here and it is very rough because we don't have, our stream of thought isn't linear like this um, and we don't really understand how we can pull memories and skills and all the stuff we do into our stream of thought. But you might think of access consciousness as like an old fashioned film reel. You think of the reels as everything that's in your, in your mental content, all the memories, all the things you've learned, all the television shows and movies you've watched, all the songs you've listened to. But you only have access to some of them at any given time. And that's the one that's right in front of the light. So how old-fashioned films worked is the film reels would spin, light would shine through this little window in the middle, um, rotating shutter lens, etc. And then that is what's projected out onto the screen. So you have all these millions of little cells flashing by and that simulates movement and motion. And your access consciousness is whatever the lens is flashing on in that very moment. Like I said, very, very rough metaphor, but the idea is you have access to a certain set, certain subset of what is in your entire consciousness, and that's what you can access at any given time. So the job for Block is to describe why these are two separate concepts of consciousness. Why are they different at all? Uh, recall from the previous lecture that most theories argue that everything is representational and that's the totality of consciousness is how we represent the world and how we represent the, our minds in our own experience. And Bloch is saying, no, it's a mongrel concept and we need to break it down into A and P because they're two different things. Um, and he tells us why he thinks phenomenal consciousness is different to access consciousness. Okay. He tells us that phenomenal consciousness, or the what it's like of experience, is different fundamentally to cognitive, intentional, and functional mental states. These are the information processing. He tells us that when he says cognitive, he means it involves thought. When he says intentional, it means that your mental state is about something else. We'll also look at intentionality later in the semester in a lot more depth for all all we need to know right now is that when a state is intentional, it's about something. So when you have an intention to go get a glass of water, your intention is about your desire to go get that glass of water. Um, and functional is like the functional systems that we studied, where it's like a, a software program 
running operationally on our physical hardware. So all that, Block thinks, can be described representationally, which means we can eventually get to it scientifically. We'll be able to figure out how our brains physically represent the outside world, informationally. But our phenomenal consciousness, these qualia, again, they're, the reason that they're different, the reason that they're a real and separate kind of consciousness is because sometimes they are not representational. They're only experiential. There's experience, but there's no access. So he has to contend with the idea of the person who would come against his theory and say, no, even phenomenal consciousness, the what it's like, the qualia, is representational. Um, and this person would say, when we're actively aware or consciously thinking, we're always aware of something. And Bloch would say, no, that's not true. Um, sometimes we have conscious states that aren't about anything. They don't represent anything. They just are. They just are experience. So now he's going to try and build his evidence or his justification that these things are actually separate, and it is the case that sometimes experience doesn't represent anything at all. And to do that, he tries to pull them apart, and he says, well, are there any instances in the real world where you have access consciousness without any experience of whatever the thing is? So... This seems unrealistic in the first glance, but if we go back to the philosophical zombie or the highly complex robot that can fool us, we can say that it has no internal experience at all, but it does all of the information processing and can fool us, kind of like John Searle's Chinese room. But people don't want theoretical thought experiments. They want real life uh, instances of something where you could have all of the information processing and have that kind of consciousness, but not be aware of it and not have any internal experience at all. Remember, we're looking for real reasons to have a split between different concepts of consciousness. So we might not have the perfect information uh, to make these kinds of concepts or break them down, but we do have knowledge about the empirical world. Um, and so far, every complex brain that we've ever seen, human beings, do have qualia, do have experience. So this is a point against Bloch. But this is where uh, Bloch's experiment with people who have blind sight comes in. And I say it's a thought experiment, but it's based in the real world. It's based in empirical data and actual people that he argues have A without P. When you have blind sight, you have some lesions in a region of your brain associated with processing visual information. Your eyes actually still work perfectly. So you get data that comes into your eyes and it's a real representation of whatever's out in the world, but your brain can't process it properly. So you have little blind spots in your field of vision that you just don't see anything and your brain makes up for it and it fills in the details. So, well, of course, a lot of scientists have done studies on people who have blind sight. And it turns out with simple stimuli, like an X or an O on the screen, they put it in their blind spot. They can't experience seeing the X's and the O's in their blind spot, but they guess well above chance correctly as to which one is being flashed in front of their eyes. So there's some alternate processing system that doesn't let them experience seeing the X or the O, but they still, according to Bloch, have access to that visual stimuli. It's purely information processing, and it is very weak compared to healthy sight, but it's there. There's access to the data without having a phenomenal experience of the data. So then he says, why shouldn't there be the possibility of this happening a little, uh, a little more accurately? 
and that's where super blind sight comes in. Uh, you have to prompt someone with blind sight to guess, otherwise they would just see a blank nothingness. <coughs> Excuse me. But he imagines that this super blind sighter would not have to be prompted. They would not be able to experience something, but they would have access to the data anyway. <coughs> Excuse me. A super duper blind sighter would be able to see perfectly in an information pro processing way, but not experience any of it. And then we're right back to the zombie again. And because we're wanting to stick with the real world, the super duper blind sighter isn't much use for us as evidence that you can separate A and P. But this super blind sighter, uh, they say, is more realistic. It's more like what the real world actually offers. And it is some amount of proof that you can separate experience and access to data, information processing sort of consciousness. What about the reverse? Can you have a what it's like without having a logical train of thought? And now this case, this seems to be a lot easier because we might say that tons of animals on our planet might fall into this category. They don't have the ability to have attention or focus or long-term planning or goals or abstract complex language. They don't have a train of thought like we do, but they certainly have experience like the bat, like our pet dog or cat. But the only real empirical evidence that we have access to at the moment is still us, is still our experience of consciousness. <coughs> oh, excuse me, when I talk for a while, my throat really dries out. I apologize. So, he tries to bring it back to us and our experience. And he says, imagine some times where you're studying in your room and you become aware of something that's been in your experience for a long time. So imagine you're really focused on what you're reading or what you're watching on TV or whatever, and you slowly become aware that there's a jackhammer and that it's been there for hours. You just never paid attention to it. And this is where he's saying that our experience is so complex that we can easily have P without A. That our A is what we're actively focused on or aware of, and then everything else recedes into the background and is P without A, our experience without access. We don't have access to everything in our phenomenology or what it's like at any given moment is the argument. Near the NT takes on the idea of monitoring consciousness because some people who have disagreed with his division of P and A have brought up mo monitoring consciousness, which is the idea that something is conscious only because we're continuously monitoring it internally. So that's our stream of thought. There are wider, he gives three or four different types of monitoring consciousness, but he lumps it all together because the only thing he's arguing against is the idea that our what it's like or our P consciousness counts as monitoring consciousness because he doesn't think it does. He thinks that um, it doesn't work because even if we are constantly monitoring the environment around us and the experience and we can turn our attention to whatever is in our immediate environment, it still doesn't get us to qualia. No amount of monitoring tells us why red looks red and why green looks green. So we're still stuck with it. We're still stuck with this qualia and we need to explain it. And it must be that it's not always representational. It just is. So I don't have a slide for it here. I thought I did. He goes back and he starts to talk about how his division of P consciousness and A consciousness could be on the road to changing from Mongo concept to something more like a cluster concept. Uh, if you have questions, 
or confusions about this, again, always email me or come to office hours. Otherwise, I will see you in the next unit where we take a different perspective on how we might classify consciousness.